Yeah, well, actually, our presidents are going to kick us off, but I did want to let everybody know, as Wayne said, you do have your mics open, but there are a lot of us on the call, almost upwards of 200 people or more. So let's please uh, make sure that we do have our um, mics on mute unless we're talking. But we also want to make sure that we want to hear from you. We want to direct your comments and questions to the chat room. We do have a couple people monitoring them, three people actually, in fact, monitoring the chat room. So please put your comments there um, and then we'll open a Q&A session at the end of the presentation with Wayne. And Wayne's going to be uh, very interactive and very quick and he'll also grab chats along the way. So um, you, you won't be disappointed, right Wayne? Okay. <laughs> I'll pull okay. you. All right. So I'm going to uh, transfer back over to over, over to Brandon Coleman, our president of, of PMI Metrolina. We'll get he'll get us kicked off. Brandon. Yep. I'll take myself off mute. And um, actually, uh, Kevin, if you're on, if you want to kind of. Uh, start things off and then Yogi, you can kind of follow up and, and I can follow up with Metrolina if, if that makes sense to everyone. Kevin, are you, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm ready to go. All right, my name is Kevin Hulquist. I'm the president-elect for the Triad chapter. Uh, Gene Arney is actually in the car. He's probably listening on the, on the road. But uh, just wanted to let you know about some special things that the uh, three chapters are trying to collaborate. This is one Hello. of the efforts. Hello. And uh, our expectation, our hope is that you will uh, start staying tuned for various efforts that we have. Um, we're, we're talking about professional development for this year. Um, we're also talking about some different kinds of uh, networking in various, um, in the COPs as well as some other opportunities. And just so you know, we, we meet every other Saturday and we will be bringing in some of your chapter leaders as uh, in conversation there. So. Uh, we look forward to working together. We're looking forward to this night uh, where we can talk about what the cool things that happen in Carolina, North Carolina. So I'll take it back to, to Yogi or to, to Brandon. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, and um, this is Yogi Matswami, president of the North Carolina PMI, NCPMI chapter based in Raleigh in the central North Carolina area. It's great to have so many uh, such a wonderful turnout. And a couple of months, I think a month or so ago, we said we will start collaborating with the other chapters and put together a virtual event in this brave new world. And I'm really glad to see the level of engagement and enthusiasm. I think you'll have a wonderful session. And um, again, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this first but not the last virtual chapter meeting I'm sure we'll have this year. And I just heard that Bobby uh, Robinson, who's the VP of Programs, is having a little bit of difficulty joining. So you may hear me again if I need to walk through the slides on his behalf. Back to you, Brandon. All right. All right. Thank you, Yogi. Um, for you guys who may not know me, I'm Brandon Coleman, President of PMI Metrolina. And we are uh, working um, with our partners here. And this is our first event. So we're looking forward to that. Got an uh, exciting event for you guys today. Um, I do want to take some time to send, send out some special thank yous uh, to Insight and CapTech um, for being such great partners of ours. Also, I uh, see Central Piedmont uh, Community College along with UNCC at Charlotte. So thank you guys for always being um, a fantastic partner of ours, and we're looking forward to uh, a wonderful uh, meeting today. So uh, without further ado, I'll kick this back off to you, Rhonda. Rhonda, you're on mute. Hey, Yogi, can I kick it back over to you? Because uh, this was actually Robbie's uh, up first. Uh, Bobby's up first, sorry. So these are your next few slides. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. Um, uh, just to give people an overview of the chapter, we were founded in 1985. Currently, we have over 4,100 members. You can see the slide. Uh, the, the good thing about our chapter, I think, from my perspective, two things. I want to call out things that are not on the slide, which is typically what I do. I think we're one of the most diverse chapters and the 13th largest chapter by, it, now I guess for the 14th globally. So uh, one of the things we've always tried to do is to start the partnership with other folks, other companies, organizations. I'm glad to see that uh, in, in growth this year. 
and you can kind of read the thing. Our biggest objectives are to keep the members engaged, keep them updated, networking, earn KDUs, and all the stuff that we do. And the retention rate, as you can see, we keep pretty high. So our members keep coming back, and we're enjoying a pretty good growth rate as well. Uh, to our guests from uh, Metrolina and Piedmont, if you have any questions, feel free to contact any of our panelists. We'll be glad to, or any of the members, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. And you can always visit us at ncpmi.org to learn more. So I'll keep the slides moving. And, um, and like we, have a bunch of, we also have a bunch of events planned, and we are in the process of modifying our annual plan to include many more virtual events that in, involve collaboration with other entities. Okay, next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, Annette from the Triad chapter is up. Annette Hayes. Um, well, hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for thank joining. You. Again, my name is Annette Hayes. I'm um, um, the VP program, program for the Triad chapter. And we're uh, excited, excited to partner with, with, with all of all you. This is um, something that we've been talking about doing. doing. Um, so, um, so one of the things, things I wanted to say to all of our upcoming things that we have. Um, so um, for May 11th, we have EQ, EQ for Project, for project Managers, Managers and that's and that's 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 here. Um, Annette, um, we're getting Annette, we're getting a lot of echo on your line. I don't know if you've got your computer as well as your phone uh, going, but we're getting a lot of echo on your uh, microphone. Okay. You need to turn off either the uh, you need to turn off either the phone or the computer, one or the other. Okay, I did the phone. Is that better? Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure I had it on mute, but I guess everything wants to come through. Um, but I wanted to I'll let you know we have some great events plans um, coming up, and with of course the COVID nineteen, we had to make some changes and really go virtual. So this is a great uh, meeting for us to learn those things, incorporate some of those things. Um, and so we'll be doing some more things throughout the month. So just continue to check our website um, at, at North Carolina at nctriadpmi.org. Um, so thank you all so much. Is there a way to connect to the WebEx? Uh, it's saying it's full. I honestly can't tell you why it's getting that message because we have 121 people on the call, <laughs> and it is set for uh, it is set for multiple folks. So I honestly can't tell you why WebEx is doing that, except I guarantee you it's a WebEx challenge. Um, but people are uh, try totally using Chrome. Growing, so. I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm using it Chrome. seems to be I mean, a problem. I'm using Chrome. And I use WebEx on a routine basis. It definitely is a WebEx thing saying it's full. Yeah, it's a WebEx yeah. thing because uh, I have 121 people on the list right now. Yeah, I'm getting the same thing. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I am, I am too. To okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's do this. We can't magically solve the problem while the boat is in the water. Uh, we are recording this session. You are obviously able to connect by audio. Uh, I don't know what's happening, uh, but it's apparently happening to numerous people. So uh, we're aware of the problem. We can't really fix it right this red hot moment, although if you could see what I'm doing back here, you would see me scrambling. Um, so we are doing the best we can. We are aware of the problem. And the slide deck, Tish actually has the slide deck, and she can send that out to everybody, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Can you send that out now so we can look at it as people are talking? Because we can all get in via audio. Right. Well, somebody with the, somebody with the email list can do that. <laughs> Thank you. That, that person is not me. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, it, there will, in fact, be uh, PDU credits, and Rhonda or somebody can explain how to go about doing that. But we were talking, I think, about Metro Atlanta chapter. You're muted, Rhonda.
Can you guys hear me? You were on mute. Now you're back. Oh, I'm not. Okay. Um, Rhonda Evans, VP of Programs for Metro, I'm um, sorry, Metro Atlanta. Uh, so we're founded in 1985. We have communities from the mountains to the beaches, 11 different communities, and they're listed here from Asheville to Wilmington. We have over, uh, almost 3,000 members um, consisting of 98 volunteers, and it's actually volunteer, um, it's volunteer week. So I want to thank all the volunteers that are on, represent all three chapters here today on the call. And if they are not on the call today, please make sure you thank a volunteer because it's a lot of work and, um, you know, we want to, everyone wants to make this the best possible um, event for your chapter. So I um, want to thank them. Uh, also wanted to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 and you can see we have well, we have a blood drive with our PMI Metro Lina chapter, so you can feel free to click on that link once you get the deck, and uh, we'll have a free T-shirt for those who do uh, give blood, and you can actually go on, on the app and you can see how many people who have, who have actually donated blood, which is pretty cool. So, um, speaking of volunteers, I want to highlight Deborah Donaldson, and I think Deborah's on the call. She is our April Volunteer of the Month. She's been with PMI for over 20 years. And Deborah, are you on? I need to put you on the spotlight, literally. Um, I want to um, make sure everybody, you know, through chat, give you give her some kudos, um, chat kudos. That would be great. Um, she's been a longtime um, co-chair at Cabarrus County uh, com Community for PMI Metro Atlanta Chapter. All right. And we want to thank you and appreciate everything that you do every day. So thank you, Deborah. Thank you. All right, and so, and so without further ado, um, which we without further ado, this is my yeah. Yep, there you go. So I want to present Wayne Termel, like Mel Terme, with a, a little slant there. So, so he knew all this was going to be very important, but like ten years ago. So I think it's what, 10 or 15 years now that you've been developing this uh, remote leadership entity and look at it now. Um, you can see how important it is, unfortunately, you know, under these circumstances of COVID-19, but um, we can see it's a very hot topic and everything, every, everyone wants to, you know, be a better presenter, be a better speaker, um, be able to um, kind of move through um, our meetings and make them effective and efficient. So. Without further ado, Wayne. I don't know what ado is and why we can't have more of it, but apparently we're always trying to limit the ado. Hello, everybody. My name is Wayne Termel. I am joining you from Las Vegas today. Uh, I am apologizing for the fact that there is a challenge. Um, WebEx continues hey. to let people dribble in. So up, the cause of the problem, I don't really know, but it is out of our control. Also, I'm going to remind you to please mute your phones. Uh, somebody is doing child care, uh, which is great. We're all about that right now. And trust me, everybody's tolerance level is much higher than it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but uh, Rhonda raised a really interesting point, which is I have been geeking about this for a very long time and written numerous books, uh, two of which we're actually going to give away at the end of the meeting today, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership, and uh, Meet Like You Mean It, A Leader's Guide to Painless and Productive Virtual Meetings. So both those things are going to happen. Um, there we go. I think I took care of our mute problem. Uh, I want to tell you that there is, in fact, a plan. <laughs> All appearances to the contrary, there is a plan for today. But part of that plan is to answer as many of your questions as possible. So there is an order of worship. There are slides out there, um, which you, if you haven't yet, will be receiving, receiving shortly. But really, I want you to get your questions in queue. Rhonda is busy monitoring that. Uh, we've got people monitoring the chat. Have some fun with this. We're going to start, actually, by uh, using one of the features of WebEx, 
uh, we're going to start by asking you a question, which is how do you feel about your team's virtual meetings? Uh, do you guys rock? You do all right. You know, probably be a little bit better. You definitely could do better or the pain is very real. And I'm going to remind you as everybody votes uh, that we are going to uh, give everybody the chance to win a copy of a book at the end. And we are recording this for posterity so that those who can't join us as much as they want to uh, will have the chance. And right now we are at about 138 people on the line. So uh, whatever choke point WebEx has put on there, there it is. Uh, we're going to give it just another few seconds for the poll to finish up. And it's kind of interesting how the numbers have changed over the years. Uh, a couple of years ago, when we would ask this question, people would go, oh, the pain, the humanity, the agony, it's very real. And in fact, most of us, as you can see, are kind of doing all right. You know, it, it could be a little bit better, but we're doing okay. And that's because we're gradually getting used to this, uh, which is important. There's one more question here, which I'd like to ask, which is what is the biggest challenge for you and your project team? Is it getting people to participate? Is it the technology? Today it's the technology, but in general, what's going on? Um, that the meetings get off track and, and they just go on forever, or you know, just there are just too darn many meetings is the other question. So go ahead, uh, folks are busily voting quickly. Please do it as quickly as you can. There you go, and I'm gonna close the poll, so if you don't get in in the next, oh, 17 seconds, you won't. And I'm gonna share the results. This is kind of an interesting thing, uh, and, and it gets to, come on, five, four, three, there you go, two, one. Digging it. And this kind of shows me something really interesting, that, yeah, the problems Technology is an issue, but easily two thirds of the people who voted here voted for something that isn't specifically technology related. Getting people to participate, getting them to speak, getting them to take part in, in discussions. The meetings get off track, there's too many of them. This all makes perfect sense. Uh, and, and it fits with what we've, said at Remote Leadership Institute for a long time. What you're looking at is a model that we've developed that is part of the long distance leader, but it really was designed to answer the question, why does this feel so awkward? Uh, there have always been remote project leaders. Genghis Khan ruled half the world and never held a WebEx meeting. It can in fact be done. Uh, Julius Caesar ruled half, you, you know, did great out in France. It's when he went back to home office that things got really ugly. So it's doable, right? What we've discovered is if you look at the project management piece of it, the things that we need to do, not a lot has changed. If you break down your job into the what you have to do, not a lot has changed. You need to track, you need to help set the scope, you need to coach, you need to, yep, still need to do all of those things. What we do hasn't changed quite so much as how we do it. We're now doing it mediated by tools and technology, which in some ways are miracles, right? We, Try to imagine doing your job with a remote team and you didn't have email or Microsoft Teams or Basecamp or whatever it is that you're using. But it also fundamentally changes the way we work. Uh, for the first time in human history, 70% of business communication now takes place in writing. Think about that. That's never been the case ever. 
except for the last 25 years or so with the prevalence of email and then instant message and chat. So we've got this job that has never been easy, right? And now we're doing it in ways that are literally unnatural and in some ways are very freeing and uh, terrific and in other ways limit our ability to communicate and oh by the way 80% of people use 20% of the features of tools like WebEx or GoToMeeting or Zoom or whatever tools you happen to use. So we've got this job that's really hard doing it in ways that don't necessarily work with the way our brains work and oh by the way we don't maximize all the tools no wonder this feels awkward. And that's really what we've been kind of, uh, of dealing with when it comes to meetings. So uh, when we look at the top complaints that people have uh, about our meetings, what is it that is the problem, right? Technology doesn't work like it should. That's a problem. But the meetings are too long. They're not focused. They don't accomplish what they're supposed to do. There aren't enough, uh, you know, there isn't enough interaction on the calls. That is not specifically about the technology. It's made a little bit complicated by the technology. But people not participating is not because you're on a virtual meeting. It's because they're not participating. And if you look at Microsoft or Citrix or any of the providers, you're going to hear that two-thirds of online meeting time is considered wasted, which sounds awful, and it is. But here's the thing. That number is still at 50% for regular meetings. If you ask, what is the problem with the meetings you have in the office? They lose focus. The leader doesn't keep things going, they get off track, they waste time. So it's just meetings. So a lot of what we're going to discuss here today are relevant both to, uh, and I'm going to, no, we're getting a little bit of background noise. I'm just not sure who it's from. Uh, so if you need to mute yourself, please take care of that. Um, where am I here? Okay. So we're going to break today into two components. We're going to talk about planning the meeting, and then we're going to talk about facilitating and leading the meeting. And notice I don't say run the meeting, I mean lead the meeting, because any idiot can fire up WebEx. You really need to focus and be determined to lead a really good meeting to a really good conclusion, and that's where we're going to go. And as I say, Get your questions in queue as we go. Rhonda is really good about spotting them. And don't worry about interrupting me. I am happy to take your questions as we go. So that being said, let's talk about planning your meeting. The first thing that we need to do is figure out what is the meeting supposed to accomplish. And it's funny, we hear all the time, and you've seen the Facebook memes, I just survived another meeting that could have been an email. We've all seen it. We've all been in that meeting, frankly. And I ask people, why wasn't it an email? <laughs> why did you actually call a meeting instead of having the uh, – instead of just sending it out? And the answer is really simple, and this is on all of us. The reason is because I sent the email and nobody read it. And they're not wrong. You know it's true. <laughs> we get emails all the time and we don't necessarily take the action requested in the email and then we have to hold a meeting anyway. So the big question is, and Ann said uh, in the chat, what is, which is absolutely true, that there are email chains that never end and just go on and on. And at some point, 
it can no longer be an email. It's obvious that there needs to be a meeting. And that gets to what is the purpose of a meeting, right? Why do we meet? We meet for all kinds of reasons. But it's really important that we as the meeting leaders are able to identify why we're meeting. What is the purpose? And Tuesday morning status update is not a purpose. A 10 minute huddle is not a purpose. What is the purpose of the 10 minute huddle? We want updates on what's going on. We want to identify potential roadblocks to getting stuff done. We need to identify resources that we need to uh, get in order to make the work happen. Sometimes it's to deliver information. But here's the thing about these meetings is understanding the purpose will help you have a much better uh, meeting. So for example, if I'm just delivering information, I'm making an announcement, I'm telling everybody that something's happening, that's going to be a very different meeting than one where we need to reach consensus or make a decision. How is it different? Well, if I'm just doing a webinar, if I'm just doing a town hall meeting, we can have many, many more people. The size of the crowd is going to limit the interaction. So for example, we have, what am I looking for? We've got 150-ish people uh, on this call right at this exact moment. And we can't have everybody's microphone open and everybody talking at once. We can't uh, just start taking questions every 30 seconds every time somebody has one. The size of the crowd dictates how the meeting is going to go. Uh, we can only show the faces of the people who are panelists, for example. And frankly, I have it so that I can only see the active speaker, and sadly at the moment that's me. If we're delivering information, that's different than if we have to make a decision. If we have to make a decision, not only do we probably want fewer people, but we're going to utilize different features of the meeting platform. I am a big fan of the whiteboard. A whiteboard with 200 people is really ungainly. A whiteboard with 10 people is a fabulous tool. The chat, we're encouraging you to use the chat and put information in there. We're also encouraging to use the Q&A tabs because we want some degree of interactivity, but we're not trying to reach a consensus. We're not trying to uh, build the team. We're not trying to solve a very specific problem. So we know that this meeting is going to be larger than usual. It's going to be maybe more interactive than you're used to, but less interactive than it could be. We're going to limit who can show their webcams. We make all kinds of decisions based on the purpose of the meeting. One of the decisions that we have to make is which tools are we going to use? And what I'd like you to do is use the a chat feature and hear what, what tools you use during meetings. And we're already getting some good uh, platform ideas. People are using Mural, they're using Slack, they're using Zoom. Uh, what tools do you use? And here's a really important one. How many of you are using your webcams during your meetings? Okay. And the answer is a whole lot more than did six weeks ago, I guarantee it, <laughs> because we've all kind of been I'll forced into this. Got my registration. But okay, we, we've got somebody uh, who is. Can we just put everybody on mute? Can you? Yeah, that's uh, what? just what I am about to do here. Pretend. Mute all. There you go. Okay. Um, 
using webcams, for example, are a very big deal, right? Is your team using it? Some are using WebEx, some are using Zoom, GoToMeeting. Here's the thing, I don't care what you use. I really don't. I don't have a dog in the technology fight. But remember, 80% of people use 20% of the features. So if you have webcams and you aren't using them, if you have uh, a whiteboard or if you have chat but you tell people not to use it, you're basically working with one hand tied behind your back. So we have a whole bunch of things, some of which have drawbacks as well as positives. Obviously, one of the things we're dealing with, and this has to do with the size of the team, and for some reason we now have 170 people, so WebEx is letting people trickle in. Open microphones are a blessing in some ways, but the group gets too big, you have to mute them because stuff happens. Webcams, I'm really interested. I want to see in the chat your reaction to webcams. Uh, what do you think, in your opinion, is the biggest advantage of using webcams in meetings, and what is the biggest drawback? So feel free to use the chat. I want to talk about that. And in a moment, I'm going to come back to it because this is a really important topic right now. Whiteboards. I can't tell you how many people use whiteboards like crazy in their in-person meetings and don't use them in virtual meetings. And they serve such a great purpose in terms of focusing, in terms of giving people a dynamic to look at to encouraging participation. I am a big old fat fan of the chat. And for a couple of reasons. One is not everybody is comfortable just opening their mouth and yelling into the void. Some people are shy. Some people don't want to be rude. Some people have English as a second language challenges and are constantly told their accent bugs people. So using the chat encourages more input. Remember, about a third of you said that not getting enough interaction and feedback was part of the problem with your meetings. Well, by not using the chat, by not encouraging people to use it, you actually are uh, limiting your ability to communicate. Now, I'm looking in the chat, and a lot of you aren't using your webcams. And I'm kind of curious okay, about I'm that. Fucking supposed to log in. Um, a lot of us are, and, and I'm just checking the participate. Here we go. A lot of us aren't using our webcams for the wrong reasons. Here's the thing: the human brain craves connection. We actually, there have been studies at DePaul University and other places that our behavior changes when we put a face to a name of the person that we're talking to. Uh, one of the things they discovered at DePaul was when you can't put a face to a name, when you are a voice on the phone or a name on an email, there is an increase in negative behavior. Negative behavior being things like excluding people from the conversation, not inviting them to the discussion, uh, being overly aggressive, lying. <laughs> they find people are more honest and trusting when they actually can see the person that they're communicating with. And as I look in the chat, uh, we all know the reasons, right? You can see the body language. You can put a face to a name. One of the things that right now when people are feeling very isolated and trapped where they are, turn on your webcam next time you're talking to somebody and the first thing that happens is you're going to smile. You do it, most of us do it completely involuntarily. We see another face and our body language changes and we smile. Our brains want that connection. And there's all kinds of reasons why we don't use it. 
right? Well, I'm working at the, at the north end of the dining room table. Okay, I've got a house full of kids. Uh, the dog is running around. My spouse just keeps wandering aimlessly because he doesn't know what to do with himself. Whatever the, the situation is, as a project manager, isn't it better that you know what people are dealing with? One of the big stress points that people are reporting right now in all of this work from home is it's too much. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm an empty nester. I have a private office here in the house. It's all good in my world. I don't have a house full of kids and a spouse and a college student who's trying to take classes and all of that. But if I'm the project manager of that person, you can bet I want to know what's going on in their world. Because if I pretend like it's business as usual and I don't acknowledge what's going on with them, that's going to um, create some stress that's going to come back and, and bite us. Okay. Here's the big question. If the challenges are we're trying to get people to participate and they're not, right? If the challenge is people aren't prepared for the meetings, if the challenge is we're not, people are just taking us off track and helping us get lost, most of it starts with the agenda. And I have to tell you this, I have to tell you this, most of us do not send out a proper agenda. And I know that this is telling you to eat your broccoli. I know that. <laughs> but I also know that there are five components to a good agenda if we are willing to coach to it. And this is the challenge I'm going to uh, send out to each and every one of you. As project managers, are you helping people be accountable for their meeting behavior? Are you coaching people how best to work with their teammates on a meeting? Because if you're not, why are you surprised that your meetings aren't getting better? So what are the elements of the agenda? And you can tell that I enabled the annotation tools because people are getting doodly. Uh, here's the thing. Most of us are really good at this one, maybe this one, and that's about it. So let's take the agenda one thing at a time. We are really good at the logistics. Here's the meeting. Here's what time it's going to run. Here's the link, right? That's great. That's not an agenda, that is a timetable. That's a meeting invite. Good agenda includes what's the purpose of the meeting. Why are we meeting? What is it that we are trying to do? If the purpose of the meeting is to brainstorm solutions, the meeting, to, the message team is, we're brainstorming solutions here, right? It's not join and go answer your email. What's the purpose of the meeting? And it should be explicit. And the reason the purpose of the meeting is explicit is it helps you keep your meeting on task. Because if where people are taking you doesn't meet the purpose, you, are, you and your team are within your rights to table that discussion. Hey, Wayne, Jay um, has a good comment about different time zones. Yeah, what about time zones? Okay, this is, um, this is a, a really excellent question. And for a lot of us, trust me, I was up at 4 o'clock this morning to teach a class in Germany. So I know how painful the time zone thing is right now. This is another reason why you have to decide what needs to be a synchronous meeting and what does not. Right? Can you do a lot of the work, the information gathering, the sending things out in advance using a tool like Slack or Teams or whatever you're using 
so that the amount of time you actually have to be on the call at the same time is limited. So one thing is you need to really make sure you need to have a meeting if you're crossing time zones. The second thing is try not to constantly impose on one person or one group of people. If I'm the one that's constantly missing dinner or because I live on the West Coast, I'm getting up at four or five in the morning to accommodate you, over time, I'm going to get grumpy about it. And I know I was hired knowing that was going to happen. And I know the company is based in New York or London or wherever it is. And if I'm constantly the second class citizen, that can make a pretty considerable distance. So try to share the pain of the time zones. And then the third thing is, if it is a meeting that they're only attending so that they're in the loop, record it. Make it available. Record the meeting, and then they maybe don't have to attend. And they are responsible, though, for viewing the recording and taking whatever action items comes out of that. You can't change the size of the globe. You can't change the, the time zones themselves. But you can be cognizant of how it affects people and find ways to mitigate that. So we were talking about time zones. Here's the thing about the agenda. The purpose of the meeting is important, but so is identifying the desired outcome. We know as project managers, if we don't define what success looks like, that project is going to go all over the place. If we don't define what's in scope and what's not, we can do this. We can set that so that the team is, in is empowered. Uh, the team is actually empowered to say, hey, we're getting off track here. As the meeting leader, you do not have to handle everything yourself. As a matter of fact, the clearer the agenda is, the clearer the team is aligned with the purpose of the meeting and understand the desired outcome, the easier it is to stay on task because they will hold each other accountable. If, Because you know how Rhonda is. She starts taking us down a rabbit hole it's okay for everybody else to say, hey, we've only got 30 minutes and we still need to do this. What it gets to, and this is the one that, uh, like I said, we do a really poor job of this in general, which is managing our expectations around meeting behavior. If somebody on your team talks your ear off about a problem, and you put it on the meeting agenda, and they don't say anything. What do you do about it? Are you telling people, hey, I expect you to read this and come prepared with solutions, and then they obviously didn't read it, or they obviously didn't come prepared with solutions. Are you asking people to be accountable for that? You can. I know as project managers, we're not always their real boss, but there is accountability. If they know what's expected and they're held accountable to it. But if the definition of your meeting is we call the meeting, they log on, they say hello at the beginning, and they log off at the end, they're not adding value to the project. They're not accountable to their teammates. And then finally, making the pre-work assigned to them, whether that is um, on SharePoint, whether that is however you do that, right? But think about how the meeting would go if everybody knew how to log on and get on. They knew what time. They were there on time. They knew the purpose of the meeting. And they understood the desired outcome, so they knew what was on task and what was not. They knew what was expected of them and were accountable for that behavior. And they knew how to find everything they needed before the meeting. 
would that make a difference to your meeting? So I know that a lot of us think we send out good agenda, and the plural is agenda, by the way. Um, but yeah, are we doing that? And if you did that for every meeting, would that make a difference to your meeting? All right. So all of that is planning. That's great. Mike Tyson said Mike Tyson said everybody has a game plan until they get punched in the mouth. Oh, I like that. Quote. Everybody has a plan yeah. I've heard it. for weird. their meeting until the meeting starts. <laughs> right? Then then we have a problem. So let's talk about facilitating the meeting. And again, I want you to use the chat. I want you to um, put in what are your best practices? What are the, um, and send, make sure you send it to all participants, not just to me. What are some of your best practices? Uh, we start with the ground rules. How is this meeting going to be run? And again, what's the purpose of the meeting? What's the desired outcome? If it is expressly stated, this is what this meeting is about, it gives you permission to not do things that aren't on that list. If people are trying to take you down the rabbit hole, you and the whole team can help keep them accountable. How you're going to achieve it in terms of participation. If this was a normal class that we do, for example, that we cap at 12 people, the level of interaction, how we're interacting, would be very different than on what is essentially a webinar, right? I mean, WebEx right now is telling me there are 184 people on this call. The ground rules matter. You know, mute yourselves because the background noise is bothering everybody else is a reasonable expectation on a call this size. I generally don't have people mute themselves unless they absolutely have to in a class. How you're going to interact. Beginning of this meeting, we told you Rhonda's going to be monitoring the Q&A box, the actual questions in there. The chat is for general comments and and uh, information and answering questions, some things like that. How you're going to manage the time is an expectation. If you're meeting and they're constantly running long, you need to tell people. And the best thing you can do is not fly solo. Appoint a time manager. Somebody whose job is to watch the clock and say, hey, Wayne, we got 20 minutes left. Here's the thing. Create the meeting culture that you want. Don't assume that everybody operates under the same principles that you do. Set the expectations for the meeting. Run the meeting to those expectations and hold people accountable. That's how you change the meeting culture. There's a couple of comments there that you might want to speak to. Um, agenda in advance, like you said, but also materials that will be covered. Mm -hmm. um, someone also suggested having uh, on a long meeting to have a break, a recess, if that's what your ground rules are. Whoop. Sorry, Rhonda. I am. Working on, hang on one moment. Okay, we're going to try that again. Okay, we've got, some of you are not muted, so please, 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 the mute all is not working. Please turn off your microphones. That would be lovely. Um, Okay, what else? Oh, yeah, I'm looking in the chat. Cindy said, ask for a volunteer, not just to keep the time, but watch for rabbit holes. 
are we in fact going down a rabbit hole? And a big one, one that I really like, this is not mine, is every team needs an Elmo. That's the ability to say, enough, let's move on. When the meeting is going round and round, sometimes when you're leading the meeting, it's really hard to listen, think about what's being said, keep an eye on the time, whatever else you're doing. Get help with the whiteboard. Get help with monitoring the chat. Get help with monitoring the time. And that's also a really, really good way to engage other team members. And even the people who sometimes crave the spotlight, it gives them a job and something to do, which is not a bad plan, by the way. All right. I want to talk very quickly, and I know I want to talk about hybrid meetings. This is where you've got some people in the room and some people dialing in. And we know that there are some challenges with this, right? And I bet you if I look in the chat, we're going to start seeing what some of those things are. Uh, the people in the room dominate the conversation. The people, there's so much noise, in fact, in the room that the people on the phone or online can't hear. That's uh, very often a challenge. Uh, the people in the room get first kick at everything, and the people remotely can't get a word in edgewise. These are very, very real problems. So how do you go around that? I would love to hear uh, what your best practices are for this. And we're going to look at them in the chat. Jonathan said, go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves and do the same thing with those on the phone. Yeah, absolutely. I am a big fan of uh, the participant list. I like seeing the participant list on a virtual meeting because I like to know who's there. If the meeting is too large, having everybody introduce themselves can sometimes take a, a little bit of time, but it can make a difference to the dynamic of the meeting and, and knowing who's there and how we're, we're handling this. Uh, what else have we got here? Make sure you ask the people on the phone for their input. Yeah, absolutely. And here's the challenge, okay? There's, there's two things about virtual meetings, and I'm going to hold you all responsible for this, okay? The first thing is that the... There is something that happens in a meeting that makes it almost impossible not to ignore the people on the phone. And here's what it is. We run our meetings with our eyes. So as you're going around the room, as I'm talking and I know I'm going to call for questions, I already know who has a question, right? I'm looking over there and Yogi looks like he's just confused. So I'll stop and say, Yogi, do you have a question? You know, Brandon, you look like you have something you want to say. And then somebody else's hand goes up and my eye goes there. And we do that in a split second. It happens very quickly. Now I want you to think about the people on the phone. They want to participate. They have a question. They have a comment, something they want to add. And it takes a whole lot longer for them to jump in. And here's what I mean by that. If I'm sitting 100 miles away and the leader says, so anybody have anything you want to add? Think about what I'm going through. Yeah, I have something I want to say. Oh, somebody else is probably going to go first, though. Oh, nobody said anything. Okay. Oh, I'm on mute. It actually takes several seconds for the people who are remote to be able to fully participate. Meanwhile, the people in the room are jumping in, and what happens on a lot of WebEx or virtual meetings is this. 
So anybody have any questions? Okay, good. Let's move on. We don't give people sufficient time to be able to jump in. So I have something for you. This is called the five hippopotamus rule. Patent pending, it's mine, stamp, stamp, no erases, but you're welcome to it. When we're leading a virtual meeting, there is a tendency to be afraid of the silence. As the person leading the meeting, we think silence is bad. And so what we wind up doing is we don't give people enough time to fully participate. What you need to do is give yourself five seconds. And the way that you do that is, so anybody have anything they want to say? And in your head, you count one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, three hippopotamus, four hippopotamus, five hippopotamus. Now you've counted five full seconds. Now you probably have given people enough time to start jumping in. By the way, as project managers, it's kind of interesting because I know as I did that, you went, oh, what's the big deal with hippopotamuses? Why didn't you just say Mississippi? Because we say Mississippi. It depends where you're from. I was teaching a class on virtual meetings to a group in Europe, and I said, you count five Mississippis. And one of the people from Germany said, was ist das Mississippi? Why are, do we have to count Mississippis? And I said, no, that's just something Americans do, and I never really thought about it. What do you use? You go, oh, I use hippopotamus. Five hippopotamuses it is. And that's an example of not only something that is important to know for the meeting, but there's a cultural bias there that we are often blind to. If I just told a bunch of people in India, five Mississippis, what does that mean, right? It, it causes as many questions as it, as it answers. I'm looking in the chat here. Uh, you make sure the people on the phone get their input. One thing that I would really, really suggest is that at least occasionally, you not just solicit their input, you actually start the input with the people who are remote. Very intentionally give them the first chance at the question or the comment for a couple of reasons. One is they get really tired of always, you know, everybody in the room talks first, and then you go, okay, what about the people on the phone? No, I'm good. Everybody's already said it. You want to make sure that you are valuing their input and giving them the chance to contribute very early in the process instead of always being an afterthought. So you not only intentionally solicit their input, but you make an effort to have them go first. Uh, Karen says she alternates. She actually specifies in the room and then not. Great. That's mindfully facilitating the conversation. Uh, we also, uh, I'm looking at the comments in the chat because you are a very smart group of people who have been in a meeting or two in your life. Uh, Make sure that people identify themselves and say their names. I'm going to tell you something flat out. One of my favorite things about web meetings is once the meeting starts, I go to what they call speaker view so that I don't see 20 people like a Brady Bunch across the top of the, of the screen. I go to speaker view because that way whoever's talking is identified and their name is on the screen and so i don't have to try to figure out who's talking i can tell that it's rhonda or you know it's brandon or, or whoever it is so utilizing the real estate on your screen can also help you uh know who's talking right uh Yeah, so Kimberly said, you know, something else that you can do 
is you can have somebody in the room, and I call this being the speaker monitor, uh, have somebody whose job is to listen for those people trying to speak. You know, hey, Wayne, shut up a minute. Uh, Annette has something she wants to say, right? So you're actually making room for people to participate. You're also managing the noise around the speaker. Uh, not wrinkling papers and, and doing some of those things. Um, one of the really annoying things, and we've all been in that meeting, where somebody in the room says something and everybody laughs, and the people on the phone have no idea what just happened, or the static, you know, sound gets a little staticky, and then the person in the room says, yes, and your paycheck depends on it. Okay, <laughs> help them out. When somebody in the room speaks, make sure that it's heard. And here's the thing, and I'm starting to see this more and more now. Ask yourself why you're having a hybrid meeting. Does it make sense for part of the group to be working at a disadvantage or does it make sense for the playing field to be level and everybody be on webcam, everybody have access to the chat, everybody see what everybody else is seeing? And more and more people are saying, you know what, we don't need to fight for meeting room B, which is always full anyway, right? We can have everybody on the web meeting or on the Skype call or whatever you're using. Again, there are good reasons for getting together physically, but make those choices purposely, right? Why are we meeting like this when we know it's not ideal? Maybe there are alternatives. I'm just going through the chat. Uh, Oh, no, Robert, Robert, Robert. All right. Let me address the elephant, or should I say the dinosaur in the room. Uh, in the chat, Robert just said, you should stay one Stegosaurus, two Stegosaurus, because you look like the guy from Jurassic Park. <sighs> it's a good thing I'm not wearing my hat today. I really look like him then. Um, okay, yes, he was rich, and, and he was a, a really nice guy. But he was also 70, so cut me some slack. Uh, let's see. Uh, what if... I would love to do that, but I'm always the one sharing my screen. Yeah, about screen sharing. It is a wonderful tool for keeping everybody engaged. Visually, people need to see something. One of the problems with having a hybrid meeting is that not everybody is actually physically looking at the same thing and focused on the same data. All right, we have a couple of other things here, but I really, really want to make sure that we are getting your uh, questions in here. So get your quest. Good Lord, there's a bunch of questions in the Q&A. At least there's a large number of them. So I'm going to assume that Rhonda is screening those. Yep. Uh, just one more quick thing about getting participation, which is have a questioning strategy. We tend to fall into a rhythm, and we've all been on those meetings. So any questions? OK, good. There are a couple of things. First of all, if you hold your if you ask people to hold their questions until the end you are not going to get very many questions you know why cuz if they don't have questions the meeting is over if i've been sitting there for 45 minutes praying for death and now it's question time and i know i'm already late for my next meeting how active am i going to be I know how active I should be, but how active am I? So one of the things is build along the way time for questions. 
you don't want to go down a rabbit hole. You don't want to get totally thrown off. But if people have a really important question, isn't it better that they get answered while you're talking about that subject than hang on to it until the end of the meeting? The other thing is we tend to, so anybody have any questions? And you know who answers that? The people that always answer it or the people who are really, really annoyed and motivated? A lot of people aren't comfortable just shouting out the, the answer. They're not comfortable butting into the conversation or, or maybe I'll talk over somebody or I'll, I'll be in somebody else's way. It's fine to ask those questions, especially with a small group. But there are other things you can do, including call on individuals. And you don't want to call on those individuals in such a way that you're embarrassing them. Right? You're not doing it because, ha, 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 uh, Keith isn't listening, and by golly, I'm going to get him. So I'll start to say something and go, Keith, what about you? And now I've busted him. That's not what you're trying to do. But it is important if somebody was talking to you earlier and they were, you know, Kimberly uh, was really concerned about this or she had something to say to you earlier on in the day, it's perfectly fine to say, Kimberly, I want to ask you about this. I know this was important to you and give her the chance to respond. And notice what I did there. I said her name first. Then I asked the question, and then I gave her the opportunity. Okay, if you start with calling on somebody and they weren't there for a moment, they tuned out, now you've created a stressful situation that doesn't need to be there. So if you are going to call on people individually, give them some warning you're going to do it. And one of the things you can do is use the private chat. I am a big proponent of if I know that I'm going to call on Carolyn about something, I'll send her a chat message and say, hey, I'm going to ask you to talk about that conference you went to, get ready. Or is it okay if I share the conversation that we had earlier today? And I'll do that by I am so that when I unmute Carolyn's phone, she's good to go and she sounds prepared. If you don't do that, if you just let whoever wants to speak, speak, you generally get the same people. I call them the team lawyer. This is the one who decides to speak for everybody all the time. And sometimes they think they're doing you a favor. Well, nobody else is going to talk. I'll do it. But that's not why you're having a meeting. <laughs> you want to hear from everybody. So how do you control? And you can go ahead and use the chat. How do you control those people who tend to dominate the meeting? How do you, how do you, without insulting them without making them feel like they're being grounded, how do you handle your over-contributors? Uh, Beth said, ask them to report on something during the meeting. So absolutely give them a role. Give them a specific time where the spotlight is on them and they may be less likely to try to draw it to themselves. That's a great idea. Anybody else, what do you do with your over-contributors? Uh, Anne said, I try to ask the quiet ones if they have questions. Uh, and that's a, a really good idea. I love the way David phrases this. Let's hear from somebody we haven't heard from yet. Hey, that group in Dallas has been really quiet. What's up with you guys? And a couple comments we have been going around Robin and asking everyone to make sure everyone's involved. Absolutely. And that goes back to the ground rules, right? Be ready because I will be calling on all of you. And here's the thing. The first time you do that, you're going to catch some people unprepared. 
But if they know that that's how these meetings work, they will eventually be prepared and ready for it. And you start to change the culture of the meeting a bit. So yeah, the idea of the round robin or give them a job, right? Make make your over contributor the chat monitor or watching the questions or whatever. Uh, so those are really, really good. Yeah, um, Wes just said, ask those who haven't provided input yet. I actually like to phrase the question, let's hear from somebody we haven't heard from yet. Because it do, does two things. It's kind of a message to the over contributor, hey, we're going to give somebody else a chance here. But it also tells the people who haven't contributed, it's your turn. And you are, there are no excuses. You're seeking their input. You've created the space for them to contribute. And that's really important. All right. We have covered a lot of ground. We looked at planning the meeting. We talked about how to facilitate the meeting. We've talked about some of the tools you can use. But I want to make sure that we're answering your questions specifically, and then we'll get to a couple of things. So here's the deal. Uh, Rhonda, you have the questions there. Yep. Ready? Oh, let's take what we got. All right. So the last one I think you answered, uh, would you suggest the room participants have active roles in the meeting and wait until after the virtual meetings, have a ch virtual people have a chance to talk? Yeah, there's kind of two components there, right? W one part is we give them specific roles. Not a bad idea. And, and for two reasons. One is it keeps certain people occupied. And I don't mean to be cruel when I say certain people really need to be occupied. You know who they are, right? So giving people roles is important. The most important thing it does, though, is it takes the heat off you. For example, if I am leading the meeting, I'm trying to remember who I've heard from and who I haven't. I'm asking the question. I'm trying to hear their response. We want to capture it on the whiteboard, and it needs to be spelled correctly. I will stroke out and die. That is way too much going on. Much rather, I say, hey, Roseanne, would you do me a solid? Would you capture on the whiteboard for me, please, while I lead the discussion? My brain is free to do the stuff that, as the leader, I need to do, which is make sure I'm hearing from people and clarifying <laughs> responses and doing all of that good stuff. And the grunt work, watching the chat, not that Rhonda is doing grunt work today, but she's taking a load off me by scanning the Q&A so I can focus on what I'm doing here. Yep. And so the next question, Ann Murphy, can you expand on this a little bit? She's asking about impromptu meetings. So what, what specifically did you want to know about that? Uh, you meaning, meaning no agenda? Uh, yeah, hang on a second. Let me get to Ann. I'm going down to Ann. Is she on the? She's in a Q&A. Um, she has a Q&A question. Yeah, but I think, oh, I, she's not on the. Yeah, Ann Murphy, there she is. So, Anne, uh, if you can open your microphone, tell me a little more about that question. She doesn't have a mic. Are you using your phone? Can you expand in the chat? All right, we'll go on to the next one while you do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I really do want to understand the question, Anne, so we can answer it. Yes. Okay, what's the next question, uh, Rhonda? Not any that you need to answer. They're about PDUs. Any other questions, please go ahead and put in the chat. Any other questions, best practices while we have Wayne? I what will you tell you. Uh, what to do will... when your technology doesn't work? Yeah. I have no idea that has never happened to me ever in the 15 years. Um, yes, Robert, we asked one of your questions. Did you get a sufficient answer from Wayne? 
Here's the thing about oh, – go ahead, Robert. Yep, he had a couple questions. Um, you answered the one before about the remote and letting, um, and doing roles together. Um, a couple people have asked about how do you deal with a, a conflict in the meeting. Okay, so there's a couple of things. And then I, I just read Ann's question. I think I've got an answer for her. Uh, but around conflict. Conflict in and of itself is not a bad thing. Conflict is literally you have two people with a different idea mm -hmm. or a different point of view. That is not bad. That is how ideas happen, right? That's how conversations happen. What matters is when it gets personal or what they're fighting about isn't what they're fighting about. And anybody who has ever lived with a another human being for any length of time knows that a lot of conflict is not about whatever the subject you're discussing is. So it's really important as the leader that when somebody says, oh, that idea is terrible or no, we can't do that because that the conflict is focused on the idea and the outcome and not about the person. And it's real important that we manage that with our folks. You know, Rhonda, I think you probably reacted a little harshly to that. Let's take a look at the idea. What did she say? And, and be focused on the content, not on the person who delivered it. And there's a great technique uh, one that I really, really like, I'm just looking for, there we go, just go with the whiteboard here. Um, I like to call it the pin technique. And this is a great way of um, making sure that people feel heard when they give input and that people are listening and that people are taking them seriously. So what the pin technique is, if Phil comes up with something, and I think it's the most boneheaded idea ever, and what was he thinking? I start with what was positive about the idea. Yeah, that might work. It would certainly solve this problem. I stands for interesting, which is maybe what we don't know yet, what's not clear, what the results of that would be. And then N is the negative. And here's why I don't think that's, that will work. Here's why we can't do that. Um, here's why, because it's against the law and we'll go to jail, right? But people want to be heard, and they're much more willing to receive feedback if they've been heard and their input has been given a fair hearing. So if you start with the positive, why might this work, or where is this coming or, from? I understand your desire to protect client confidentiality, right? So that's one positive. Your solution would certainly do that don't really know how that would work. Um, I'm not sure the technology has been invented yet, but there's some interesting things there worth discussing, and here's why I don't think it's a good idea. If your team gets used to presenting their feedback to each other that way, it tends not to get personal. So. The, the trick is to keep the conflict surrounded on the subject and the outcome and not on the individuals. It does not go back to your Elmo, and maybe you can go over that again, because I think you went over it pretty quickly, that people, that it's your acronym, or let's yeah, move on. Yeah. yeah, there are a couple of times when you want to Elmo, right? One is when it's just going round and round and round, and you're not reaching any kind of conclusion. 
People are just saying the same things over and over again, and that's where a lot of the uh, that's where a lot of the conflict comes from. It's like you've already said this, we've heard you move on, right? So the idea of being able to say, okay, the I, we're not getting any new ideas here. Let's take a look at the ones we've got. The other one is when somebody is trying to take you completely off topic. And we all know we've all got those team members who, you know, they're like a dog with a sock. Right? <laughs> Once they sink their teeth in, they're not letting go. And that's where, again, having somebody who isn't you or having somebody who isn't the person that they're in conflict with suggests they move on will sometimes diffuse the situation. Uh, I want to go back to what Ann said about impromptu meetings. Impromptu meetings are just meetings, right? But if we say, hey, this isn't getting us anywhere, let's get Phil and Melissa on the phone and have a conversation. And you go into Microsoft Teams and you push the button and the meeting starts, you still need to know why you're there. So there right. still needs to be something like an agenda saying, hey, let's meet, let's talk about this, and let's make a decision. We know why we're there. We have the right people there. If you don't have the right people, you don't want to have an immediate meeting. You can call it, but you need to schedule it. Because a Wayne, Wayne, you you are you are on um, wow. mute or somebody? Ah, there we go. I hear something. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe the last couple minutes. <laughs> this is Ann, by the way. This is Ann Murphy. I finally got my 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 mic, as it were. This is just Kevin Wayne. Still on there? You can't still hear Wayne. Yeah. There's some kind of lag there. I don't hear him at all. I got the gist of what he said, so I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sign language, Robert said. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we but don't know what it looks like. <laughs> Go ahead. Help. But he. He was answering my question, so we're we're good. That's can anybody not? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, we can. Yeah. Okay. That's bizarre. Welcome to, <laughs> welcome to Techno World. Yeah, um, the videos the videos were looping too, so it, like there's a lag in the system there. Yeah. So it's okay now. Okay, so here yeah, Amy, here's the other thing about impromptu okay. meetings. Um, the scariest words in the English language, if I'm not expecting a meeting, is do you have a second? I'm working, I'm minding my own business, all of a sudden I get an IM from the project manager that says, do you have a second? That's like when your spouse says, we need to talk. Nothing good starts, <laughs> nothing good starts with that sense. If you need to bring somebody into an impromptu meeting, make sure they know what you're meeting about and what it is you're trying to achieve. Because if they don't have the ability to help you reach that conclusion, you need to schedule that meeting for another time. And you don't want to freak somebody out. So, you know, I'm on with Alice. We need to talk about this. Do you have a minute is totally different than do you have a minute. The freak out factor is considerably lower when people know what you're talking about. 
Okay. I am... We did not break the internet, but the internet darn near broke us. All right. We did get up to 189 Yeah, people. we did, which may or may not be part yeah. of the problem. Thank you, Mr. WebEx. Um, all right. I am going to bring us to here. And we are going to wrap up. Ms. Rhonda, you are uh, going to bring us home. Here's the deal. Uh, if you want to win a free copy of the long distance leader or meet like you mean it. And I need to explain, I am only giving away one copy of each. <laughs> I do not have 180 copies of these books. Uh, if you drop me an email, Wayne at remoteleadershipinstitute.com, or you connect with me on LinkedIn and say, hey, I was on the PMI North Carolina call, we will put this in a hopper. Uh, people who are viewing the recording, we will add you to this, so next Monday, I will draw for the winner, and one person will get Long Distance Leader, one person will get, get Meet Like You Mean It, and I guarantee they are not the same person. So that's okay. it. Rhonda, what do you want to do on your end to bring us home, wrap it up, and otherwise uh, close out whatever business you got to do. Yeah, thank you. We do have a couple slides for each of the chapters. And I don't know if Bobby ever was able to get on. Bobby, are you there? Yogi, you might have to uh, pinch hit here again. Have you, have I don't you think Got some feedback there. I know feedback is a gift, but not like that. All right, did you give me host back? I think you did, right? I did not give you yeah, host back. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I was on two devices at the same time. I'm, my apologies. <laughs> no worries. Multitasking. No worries. Yeah, multi no, my, not multitasking. I have one on my iPad and one on my laptop wow. so I can move around my house. Another <laughs> best practice for you. Uh, yes, anyway, so. Yeah, right, Bobby I'll, could not get in. I, I don't think he's in. Bobby's not in. I, could, I don't think he would. But he's on audio. Okay, I have your uh, slide for you. Hang on one second. Okay. Yeah, thank you. This is you. Go ahead. Can you see it okay? Uh, I see one win one free copy. That's Wayne's okay. slide. Okay, Rhonda, you're the presenter, so there we go. Now we're getting there. Yeah, I'm going to invite uh, folks who attended the call to participate in the survey. And uh, you can find the survey. The link to the survey is posted. And I know quite a few of you are not signed in, but only on audio. And it could be you. So whoever is on the WebEx can see the QR code and also the link. And please feel free to scan the code on the screen and enter the survey. And you'll be entered into the raffle automatically. And I believe uh, everybody did, got a copy of the deck as well, Yogi, so yeah. they should have it there as well. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah. And then next slide there, your sponsors. Yeah, I believe um, we have. It, we want to thank our sponsors, first of all, Toastmasters International. And they are also part of one of our COPs. That's, um, the first one, the second one is Ruth Pierce and her organization, Project Motivators. She's spoken at our chapter and is also was part of planning our annual day. And Refine M is the other LLC, so other final sponsor we want to highlight here. Once again, I would like to thank all of our sponsors for helping and supporting NCPA. Great, thank you very much. Annette, I wanted to, uh, before I went ahead, you, I want to throw it back over to you to see if you have any closing comments. For yes, I don't have any slides, but I want to thank Wayne for such a great um, webinar. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed your energy and your feedback from everyone. So thank you so much. And all the other chapters, I appreciate the um, the collaboration, and I enjoyed working with all of you. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Annette. 
And then I'll bring up the last two slides. So for my Metrolina peeps, um, this is our barcode our survey. And it's seven questions, very brief questions. So you can either use the link or you can uh, scan the barcode. And uh, upcoming events, the, obviously there's one today. Uh, then tomorrow we have a virtual town hall meeting with all the board of directors. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do so. And we normally, uh, we were gonna do a poll, but I think uh, with the technical difficulties, we'll just leave it at that. We know we had some challenges and um, it's, uh, you know, Wayne has done this with uh, more than, than, I don't know what your capacity was, Wayne, but I know that it's not um, with anything to do with this license that he has, that he usually uses with multiple, um, you, know, you know, hundreds of people. So um, we're, we apologize for the technical difficulties, but um, it's something that there's on the WebEx side. So we, again, we apologize. So we want to thank each and every one of you. We appreciate you attending our first collaboration meeting and hopefully you'll come back in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Throw, thank you. I'll throw it back over to Brandon, President, to see if uh, Yogi, Keith, if you had anything else to add. Anything to add from our president? Um, I'd just like to say thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, um, all of the volunteers who, who participated and put this together. Thank you so much for the time you, you put into this. We really do appreciate it. So thank you, guys. Um, and for our, our Metrolina chapter leaders, we do have this recording. And we will be providing this out to everyone. If you weren't able to join or, or you weren't able to join by audio, we will be providing this link out. So uh, thank you all. Great. Thank you. And the recording, Wayne, when will that be ready? Uh, first thing tomorrow morning. Oh, really? Okay. So we'll send that, a link out to everybody. Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Wash your hands. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>